Hi everyone, welcome to the latest VFX Futures podcast episode. I'm Ian Fales from Befores and Afters. Today I'm talking to Sam Nicholson from Stargate Studios about the new HBO Max show, Our Flag Means Death, starring Taika Waititi. Now, the virtual production side of this show is fascinating because basically the show features a pirate ship on the open ocean which was actually filmed on a soundstage as a practical pirate ship surrounded by a 30 foot by 160 foot LED wall. Sam's going to share with us how his team shot multi-camera array plates uh, of oceans so that they could be projected on the LED wall, how they were stitched together, um, what kind of real time and other virtual production tools were used to make this possible, and also what visual effects work was involved in the show. I started by asking Sam about the test that he did to prove that this approach to making these open ocean scenes could be done. I heard they were gonna do something with Taika. I know the guys at HBO, I said, look, we'll put together a pirate test for him. So we did this online live um, with multiple cameras uh, and we, you can see it's a limited test, but that's our set right there. Uh, and we did some very creative stuff with 3D modeling and interface with flexible screens. And I, I, I wanted to see how fast we could come up with something that looked good. And you can see, we just have a wheel and a, and a piece of steel back there with some ropes. The, the, the ship is 3D. Um, the plates are photographic, so I was blending photography and 3D and trying to get it to all become one. And they were impressed with this test enough that uh, this started the discussion of how much of this show can we do on LED? And if it's significant enough, we'll green light it, right? Um, and we we estimated that we could shoot about 50% of the show on, on, um, on LED. So so then, um, you know, from there we uh, had to shoot the plates, right? So then it was like, well, if we're gonna, um, we did a lot of design work with laying out how how big a screen we would need for a full scale ship, and then once we determined the size of the screen and the shape of the screen, I went to Puerto Rico and, and we started shooting very high resolution plates, 360 plates. We started with 360 and very quickly realized that that would be limiting if you're on a boat to stabilize it. So we went, we chopped a couple of cameras up, went with 270 degrees and shot 400 terabytes worth of material um, in in horrible conditions, right? Uh, some of, you know, we shot blindly, not knowing what the episodes were going to need. We overshot just, oh, we'll go to the, what, this this will work for the Pirates Republic, you know, this will work for, you know, we just started going out and shooting a ton of water and uh and different different setups like this and uh then we came back to the and started projecting it onto these big surfaces uh scaling it up from a cg model to what we would really be using on set so it was a it was a combination of laying it out in CG as best we could, previewing it, and then going out and shooting plates that would fit those screens in both resolution and and while we are designing the hardware that can drive a 20K screen, um, synchronizing all the lights in, and then, and then, and you know, at at the end of the day, you you have the, the, the thing fits, right? You know, you- But Sam, let me, let me ask you briefly, this isn't meant to be a controversial question, but how important was it for the production for you that it be real ocean plates? What, 
you, we know that you can generate amazing oceans in Houdini and elsewhere. And, you know, that is how shows are done, like Viking shows and whatnot. I, mm-hmm. It's sort of an obvious question because I think I know what you're going to say. But it's almost against the grain a little bit in terms of what we know we can achieve simulation wise. Well, we wanted the simulations you're looking at are generally 4k, right? We have a 20 K screen, 20 horizontal 20. And we wanted five minute takes five minutes. It's a comedy. That's why I'm saying we didn't want to tell Taika, oh, you've got a 30 second clip to work with and you have to work here. We wanted 270 degrees, 20K, full resolution, no frustrum. Cameras can look wherever the hell they want on that screen and it's full res, right? So how do you how do you create a 20K, five minute long uh, take? You have six weeks before principal photography. And you need morning, noon, night, magic hour, day, and you want it to look real, you know? Uh, and so there, there would be advantages to CG, but you would have to be rendering at 20K. Um, and, it, you know, and you're going to be trying desperately to get to reality. So we did... Um, we did modify some of the plates to make the clouds look more like Los Angeles clouds or whatever, but then, then you're just compositing. But even compositing in 20K, um, you know, remember the, the original data that we were shooting is 60K, five times 12. So we were coming back from the field with the potential of a 60K world that you can capture with the push of a button run the camera for five minutes and say okay what's next right you know we got that one and we just really scratched the surface of of what we shot we overshot i think we only used maybe 20 percent of what we shot so we were, were able to capture uh some beautiful material now in in season two we'll probably use a lot more cg because we will have time uh but even at that you're talking about having the your plates have to be rendered and playable at 20k uh so it's a it turns out to be a lot more uh fast and effective if you know what you want um you know, could it be, uh, I think season two, we will refine certain things. We'll probably lean on CG some more, but it may be texture mapping, real plates and a combination. I've, I've always been a, a, a believer in kind of hybrid solutions. You pick the right thing for the right, you know, if it was a, a drama and you said, well, we only need a 30 second loop and we want to be looking this direction or this direction. You can render your plates in 4K. Uh, I would say, well, that, that then CG would become a much, uh, a much better option. But it, it isn't always the answer just because it's being used. Uh, and, and I love trying to get the organic things that happen in reality, you know, that it's just, um, there are some limitations, but there's many advantages as well. Mm. Put it that way. In, in the shots where these plates are used, how much does, did the camera need to move? And what were the challenges there of any kind of moving camera on the set? Well, um, when you, we did track all the cameras. Uh, we put up 
you know, a, a optical tracking system with 30 cameras up in the rafters so that we could track any camera or anything on the set that we wanted to. Because what we what we did was um, I, I'm always looking for the 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 design solution, if you will, you know, the you think, well, OK, we, you, you, and you have to. I think to come up with a good design of anything, you have to theorize every possibility and then pick the pros and cons of each one and weigh them and, and say, well, what part of this, where are the advantages? Where are the, okay, the disadvantage of shooting an ocean is you're on a boat and it's moving. So you have to stabilize the rigs and they've really got to be stable because you're going to put it up on a gigantic wall. So even a pixel of movement, everybody goes, you know, it's not going to work. So you have to have rock steady plates on a moving platform that's rolling around in the water with half your crew seasick, right? That's a challenge. Um, as opposed to CG, CG can be rock steady, right? Do you have time? Do you have time to do CG? No, <laughs> right? You know, so, okay, we're going to have to shoot this thing live. Can we shoot from the shore? Can we shoot from a barge? Can we shoot from a sailboat? Can we shoot right? You know, you start going through all these things, and and very quickly you realize that you see vertical displacement on the horizon. You do not see horizontal displacement, right? So that, from a design standpoint, is a critical thing to understand about stabilizing water. It has to be. It has to be vertically stabilized, not horizontally stabilized, right? So now you're you're honing in on a on a on a potential solution. Now, once you have it stabilized, you're going to want to enhance the sky and start doing some compositing tricks to it to make it look cooler. Make put a moon in, put a thing in. You know, now you're in compositing land, which compositing at 20k is not that much of a problem. Um, so once you have your plates stabilized and you have your uh, digital enhancements done to them and you have them color timed exactly like the way you want them, then you put them up on the wall, you put them through the Unreal Engine and you start driving up and up them up and down with a sine wave. So now you can make the boat rock as much as you want. So as the boat rocks left, the horizon goes down on the right, you know, et cetera. And, and as the camera rises up, the horizon rises up with it because remember you're in a curved screen. So the horizon has to be at the exact level of the screen or it will be curved, right? All right. So all these things are, uh, you say, well, do you have to track it? Well, no, you don't really have to track it unless you're going to look into that curved wall. And if your camera's at a different height, you're screwed, right? So you're making adjustments on the fly on set all the time. So then you have to be able to respond in real time to uh, color timing issues, uh, black levels, color colorimetry. Uh, when you put fog into the set, what's it, do you need more punch out of the background or less? Are you reading the cloud? You know, how do you, how do you, uh, you're doing real time color timing on, on six Da Vinci resolves at the same time. So then it's the question of how do you synchronize Da Vinci resolves? You know? And then when you do a, a master clip um, and you want to jump down, downstream to do an insert, you have everything has to update appropriately to, from a from a timeline standpoint. So everything we we do is we've written a bunch of custom stuff to drive what we're doing off a timeline, so that when you say, "Okay, we finished the master, now let's drop in and do a pickup from this line thirty seconds in," that everything updates, right? You, you know, particularly wasn't that a that much of a worry on our flag but but when we're doing car driving and stuff if a red bus is going by in the in the establishing shot that same red bus has to go by in all of the other coverage no matter how you shoot it 
that was very, we discovered that very specifically on when we did run for HBO, uh, you're on a train, you know, if, when the train goes into a tunnel and you, you, you know, and you want to do a pickup downstream, you do a master that's three minutes long and then you want to do inserts coverage, uh, all of your backgrounds, lighting, tracking, everything has to update to that moment when you pick it up. So, uh, so you know, practical, you, do, you just figure those things out when you've lived through a few productions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and just to be super clear, it wasn't like there needed to be any kind of parallax change or movement or following a character around as they walked around the boat. Yeah. Uh, well, undoubtedly, they wanted to be able to, you, you have to be able to handle Steadicam, right? There's no doubt. Uh, you get a certain amount of parallax, artificial parallax on a screen this big. Uh, and I, I come back to the horizontal versus vertical displacement. As long as you have really accurate vertical displacement, the horizon is the giveaway. The hor horizontal movement, it's water, you know? So you, you can actually get away with, with murder on the horizontal displacement, but the vertical displacement is really accurate. It has to be exactly on. Uh, otherwise you will wind up with a curve to horizon or the horizon at the wrong place. And that's a dead giveaway. So that's really all you have to worry about in this particular application. So even if you had 3D water out there, you're not gonna see it displace. You just won't. It, 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 3D water has certain advantages that you can relight it and play with it and do some stuff. And we tested 3D water and we determined that in real time, uh, in the real time engine, we could not get as good a solution uh, because you can't be, at the end of the day, you can't beat reality, you know, and, and with a, an extremely short prep, uh, if we had bet on CG and it didn't work or it kind of didn't look real, we would have been completely screwed. There was no, there's no way to dig out of that. You know, you, in a in a hypothetical world, I love the I love the hypothetical discussions because there's never a time constraint on these discussions. And the reality is production is all about time, right? If you're rendering real-time water on set or even pre-rendered water, it's a it's a different animal than playback, right? Playback is going to be more stable. It's, and you have all the color, you have all the stuff you need. And if you're not going to see the horizontal displacement, then why are you doing it, right? If you know what you want, if it's, oh, it's noon on the ocean. Well, shoot, noon on the ocean. I always, I always think um, that a lot of the more exotic visual effects solutions come out of, you know, a hammer looking for a nail, you know, and the the idea is, is is if all you have is a hammer then everything looks like a nail so if you're like a big 3d person then we got to use 3d right well i look at it from let's weigh all the possible solutions hmm. yes i totally agree of course um I, I wanted to ask you as well sam about the array plates and the challenges of stitching them together now you've your company and you've done stitching of plates for years right um, yeah. and i think in my head i never quite understand it just because i feel like it's a bit of magic going on and i really yeah. do what are the challenges of hiding the seams making those stitches work for an led screen tell me a bit about well, those stitching challenges in particular yeah the stitching is all about um well, like, like anything else, it, it depends on a lot of, of other variables that you may or may not control. Um, uh, you know, the difficulty with a, with a non-nodal rig, right? Because these are non-nodal rigs. These are, these are not mirrors and all that kind of stuff that you get into with a nodal rig. Um, it, it's a non-nodal rig. So 
how close an object is to that offset, the nodal offset is a giveaway. So if you have a telephone pole that's six feet away from a non-nodal rig and you shoot it with two different cameras, you'll never get it stitched, right, ever. Uh, there will be two telephone poles or they're off as parallax. So um, again, if you have water and the water is going to be closest 30 feet away, are you really going to see the nodal offset if you stitch it? No. Right? So you have to really understand what you're shooting. The, the rigs that we shot our flag means death with would not work in a subway right it would be a different kind of camera rig at that point um, and we did look at things like the titan ball and various nodal stitchable rigs but they were only 12k horizontal resolution and 360 we couldn't get the really high quality cinema plate out of it because they're different cameras now we <laughs> we did another show with Netflix where we did it was all night right all night driving in the rain it's called uh, Wheat Germ or uh, uh, it's uh, Noah Baumbach's new picture all night driving in the rain uh, after much camera testing we shot the plates but we shot them with Sony Alpha ones because we shot them at ASA thirty two thousand right at night now that camera we didn't use i wanted to use the black magic 12k because i wanted the 12k and and the black magic raw data is really clean um and it's a bigger camera but it doesn't shoot well you know at thirty-two thousand, <laughs> right so that's a completely different thing and you say well it's, a, it's still a volume it's still a but it's a complete different approach for shooting the ocean in the daytime versus, you know, a traffic jam at night. And so, again, the, the stitching is tough because you're going to, we came back with an extraordinary amount of data. We remember, we, I shot all the plates before and done before the series even started. So we had to shoot enough to say, well, what if they shoot at night? What if they shoot in <laughs> at, at dawn? What if they get in a storm? What if they get, well, okay, we gotta go get all that stuff, right? And, and, and um, so we were shooting somewhat blind and overshooting. So um, the, the pipeline to handle 400 terabytes of footage quickly, put it together, get it down rest so people can look at it because it's all 12K masters, right? Uh, you got to down res it quickly. It all has to have matching code to it. It has to have viz code put out so that the director and everybody can look at it. Even just viewing that much footage is, is an enormous lift. And, and that's where Stargate's uh, capacity to lift heavy data as a visual effects company comes in. We can ingest a lot of footage and move it, transcode it, stitch it, stabilize it, you know, and then put it back out. And ironically, this is, you know, anamorphic, squeeze it, you know, all that kind of stuff, de-squeeze it do all those things to it to get it to where you have a, a perfect plate for this size wall. Um, and so the pipeline to handle the, what I would call the, uh, what would normally be done in post on little tiny pieces of footage, you have to do it on giant pieces of footage that you're gonna play on set. And then this, those things all have to be ingested into the computers and split up because there is no, there's nothing that will do a, a 20K single playback. So they're in 4K chunks, right? 16 of them. And they all have to be pixel perfect and they all have to be synchronized and they have to be running through multiple DaVinci resolves with 8K deck links that are distributed across this wall. I mean, it's really like a, a giant 
you know, technical challenge, but uh, I, I think we did together with David Van Dyke uh, as the visual effects supervisor, we had a lot of discussions and, and uh, Mike Berlucci, the DP, Cynthia uh, uh, is a DP. Uh, we did a lot of testing, a lot of talking and, and saying, okay, you know, a, the, the golden rule is there cannot be a single minute of downtime on the set ever. So you, we have to have backup systems and in case a computer, you know, you see that blue screen of death or something, you better have a, an ability to switch over to a backup immediately. It's, there can be no, you know, and, and look, sometimes the, the, the D, DPs would ask, can you make the entire wall a little bit softer, right? Well, you put a Gaussian blur on that, on a 20K output, and all of a sudden it chokes and it starts running at four frames a second on the entire wall. How quickly can you back out of that? And, and ideally, what we were doing is we were doing it offline so we could see if there was going to be a problem before it was on the wall, right? So you have a complete preview system in our little video village, right? Or the brain bar as it, it became known, um, where we're rehearsing. Oh, oh, you want to see it softer focus? Great. Let's rehearse it on our, our little preview system here. So if it's going to crash, it's going to crash not in front of the entire crew, right? And, and, and you know, um, and if it crashes, we had full linear playback that we could go to on a, uh, uh, like a bunch of hyperdecks that we could stream 20K out to the wall to give us enough time to, uh, to reboot computers and things. So, with that type of redundancy, which is probably closer to kind of a NASA solution for going to the moon or something, you know, um, with that type of redundancy and thinking built into it from the start, we never had a, a single minute of downtime on the set. They never ever waited on, had to wait on the LED wall. It was always ready, always running. We'd come in, you know, at least an hour early before call so that when people arrived, the ocean was running, you know? And when they left, the ocean was running. I mean, it was just like, it was always there. The, and I think what, one of the more fun moments was uh, when the HBO execs who uh, we've known for years came to see the big wall. They all came out in the middle of COVID and were very excited to get on the ship and the ship is rocking and the water's all going like this and people were starting to get kind of seasick and I thought okay we're, we're doing it right if we can get the HBO execs feeling queasy on the ship then the show's going to work great and god bless them they 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 believed that we could do it they believed in us and they supported us throughout it uh, and that's how HBO works. It's a, it's a real pleasure working with them because they do have, they trust the filmmakers that they're going to pull it off. And, and not all studios are like that. You know, you, you, they really do trust. And this is not just visual effects. I mean, this is, you know, the directing and writing and it affects a lot of, a lot of other departments. It's not, everything isn't visual effects, but but I can, I, I can say that our experiences with uh, uh, HBO have been fantastic because we have such great uh, executive support throughout the project. That's probably a good note to end on. It's been really fun getting into that technical detail with you, as always. Uh, I'll tell you one thing. Um, working with Taika is an incredible experience because he is truly a creative genius. And... He creates a, uh, a very lighthearted atmosphere on set, even though it's very serious, but he keeps it light. He keeps it fun. And, and I think that translates all the way through the production 
to the finished screen that that everyone's having a good time everyone's having they're enjoying the experience right and honestly being on the on the revenge was like being in a, on a e-ticket ride at disneyland or something i mean it was cool to be just hanging out up there because it it, it wasn't a science experiment. It wasn't, the technology was invisible and behind the screen, it never affected, uh, it didn't become a big techno experiment. This was not a James Cameron film with everybody running around and saying, oh my God, it's gonna look great, even if they are in mocap suits and we have no idea what it's gonna look like. It looked real, it felt real. And I think that translated through uh all the comedy on the revenge is really magical because it's it's almost like we were really on a ship we were all just in this kind of crazy pirate movie with taika playing blackbeard and everybody was having a great time and i i love working on projects that have that kind of magic mm. i've got another question and it's again yeah. it's not meant to be controversial but sam when we talked about run for a magazine article that was early days really useful for the train and then you said sure just like in mandalorian sometimes we have to do traditional visual effects compositing because mm. the we they shot a scene and they used our running footage but actually it needed to be in some other train station or something like that mm. On this show, did that occur as well? Were there some moments where just because of editorial and and artistic reasons, did you still need to do any normal compositing? Oh yeah. 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 There's, there's uh, what we were able to do with the virtual production was not throw out the green screens. In fact, we, in, in many discussions with, with David Van Dyke, uh, we decided together uh, uh, that it would be great and smart to outline, put a put a teaser all the way around the top of the uh, revenge to be green, right? So we knew we were gonna, we knew we were going to shoot off the screen. You're going to look up, you know. You're going to. There's no mast on the ship, right? I mean, you know. I mean, there are. Green LED works great if you're staying on the screen, but if you're looking off the screen, what do you do? Are you ready for that? Have you thought about that? So you can see a lot of green screens are augmenting. Uh, uh, the uh, by the way, those are all 8K quads on the screen playing, and so you can see there's a lot of augmentation and 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 anticipation of augmentation. Uh, we could only afford so big a screen. And yet we wanted, we didn't want to limit the camera angles. So if Taika wanted to tilt up straight up into the rafters, what are we going to do? If he wants to look down at the floor, there's no LED down there. What are you going to do? You know, we're going to have to blend these things. So yes, traditional visual effects, uh, which I think are done seamlessly in this. Uh, we, we participated in that with our team in Malta, um, as well as, as Dineg did a beautiful job. Uh, and and uh, so, yeah, it, it, it makes the, the editorial, because the, most of the coverage is LED, right? The dialogue, it's all LED. Um, but that means that it's all done when you walk off set. Now, as an editor, you can choose take three, take five, take 12, you can recut it, you, everything's, I mean, I, I like to think of the value, ironically, of virtual production is how much material you get to throw out that looks good, right? It's, it's, I mean, you may throw out 10 takes that look absolutely perfect because you like the dialogue and when you cut it, so it, 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 it lends itself to comedy right because in, in comedy there's a lot of editing and re-editing and timing and tweaking and you know it, it's not like uh say another show that we're currently doing where 
a woman falls out of a window and gets impaled on a, on a, you know, it's a, it's a, at most a 36 frame shot. Those 36 frames will be worked and reworked and reworked and reworked. They will end up in the edit, but it's the, the scene is not dependent on timing because that's how Taika directs. He creates this very wonderful situation, attitude, lighthearted thing, and then everybody goes out and there's a lot of improv. There's a lot of funny things that happen just because everybody's having a great time and they're, they're brilliant actors working off each other. So you don't know when that stuff's gonna happen, right? And, and the last thing we wanna do is get in the way of that. Uh, so the big shots, look, when Steed is pushing the front of the ship all by himself that has been beached on the shore, that is a traditional visual effect. And there's no way we're gonna do that in LED. It's not gonna happen. But if you go in close on Steed, now is he on LED? Sure, you know, I mean, and, and how many takes do you do until he gets it just right? And editors have full choice of all the material. So giving editorial 100% uh, of the coverage, the dialogue on LED is very empowering for the comedy itself. And it's obviously speeds up the process and saves a bunch of work. So to come back to the original thing, virtual production is a tool. It is not a panacea. It is not a replacement for visual effects. It is not a replacement for lighting. You have to work just as hard with all sorts of lights to make it look really good. Uh, it is essentially a living backing. And if you know how to use it, you can alleviate the inordinate pressure that is on the visual effects people uh, to do thousands of shots and turn it into a, a handful of shots. And then they can really concentrate on what visual effects are really good for rather than just, you know, putting a background behind somebody. That's uh, so, so it, it's, a, it's a very exciting technology. And I love what I see in Our Flag Means Death. It's the perfect integration of traditional visual effects and virtual production, not to mention great production design from raw, fabulous acting and wardrobe, you know, and, and then unbelievable directing and, and writing. The writing is great, right? So, it's like an orchestra that is hitting on all, all the instruments are coordinated and balanced. And, and virtual production is another member of that orchestra. That's all, that's all it is. Mm -hmm.